Welcome to everyone. Um, I'm not sure if uh, anyone has, everyone has been here before, but this is our fortnightly um, Cat Salon West. Um, so for those of you who may not know or might not be a part of the community as yet, um, we're a community of tech professionals with the goal to inspire and empower each other to take climate action. Um, we run this call, call fortnightly um, uh, interchangeably with uh, an East one as well, Eastern Friendly Time Zone Cat Salon as well, uh, to facilitate conversations with the community. So um, today we have Phil Sturgeon, I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um, Phil's going to talk to us about reforestation, um, misconceptions, tips, tricks, what to do and what not to do. Um, this part will be recorded and distributed by our YouTube channel. Um, the next part will be off the record, um, a conversation with the attendees, Q&A, et cetera, et cetera. So stick around for that. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Phil. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for letting me natter about trees. It's one of my favorite things to do, apart from nattering about bikes or nattering about computers. Um, I am going to share my screen. There we go. I'll just get rid of that. Uh, so, yeah, born in Bristol. Um, I'm a bike nomad. I've been wandering about Europe on my bike for about three years, and I work... I used to be a software engineer for like a decade or whatever. And now, oh God, no, 20 years programming since I was 11. Uh, but now I'm like a technical product manager um, for a company called Stoplight. We do API design and software. But in my spare time, and I'm not cycling around all over Europe, this is my this is kind of the route, the blue bits are where I went in the last two or three years. Um, actually, that was, that, I think that was the first year of the tour. I got quite a bit of distance covered. Um, and the sad thing was that pretty much everywhere I went was was pretty brutal deforestation. This is uh, Finn, the everything is fine climate mascot. He came with me. Um, and pretty much everywhere I went was just mass deforestation. Um, in, in Tenerife, uh, it was it was pretty brutal. Um, in Spain, I went through a bunch of like green areas on the map uh, and it was just all like uh, deforestation for vineyards. And this created a dust bowl effect. I was literally getting hit by tumbleweeds while I cycled around um and just coughing up dirt um i went to the black forest and it's mostly just being deforested for dairy cows um I went all over the place and and everywhere in the world like the global annual deforestation rate is 10 to 15 million hectares um which is depressing because that's about the size of the uk so every year we're losing the size of the uk um there are reforestation reforestation efforts being done, but not enough to keep up with the, the rate of deforestation. We are still at a net loss every year. And that is obviously having a pretty terrible effect on the, uh, the environment. Everywhere I went, I was caught in floods, tropical storms. I saw wildfires. Um, it, it was pretty terrible. Um, there was really bad smog in a lot of areas. This is going through the middle of Spain. You could just visibly see the pollution. And I was breathing that in. Uh, all the time we're all breathing that in right um down in morocco this dry out dried out riverbeds this used to be used to be a huge river but even in the middle of their winter they had no um no like ice cap no snow caps and so there was nothing to melt to to replace this um in this dried out river were like dead uh goat skeletons it was really uh just depressing uh got caught in some crazy storms we had trees coming down all around us cycling through um france uh and yeah while i was doing that uh greenland was on fire so i just really around that time last uh over the last year or two just got to think in like we've got to do something about it i'm sure you've all had similar um awakenings and so reforestation as uh project drawdown put it is like a a, a big plays a big part it's not the way to save the world no one thing is right but it, it's it's um got huge potential to to save um a shitload of carbon it's can't words right now the potential impact um, on drawing down carbon from the atmosphere is twice that of electric cars, right? So even if everyone switched electric cars, we got on with reforestation and have an even bigger impact. So I was trying to figure out how I could get a bunch of trees planted and I came across Ecology, another Bristol based tech company, um, software engineers doing good. And um, I set up a little forest on there and I got people donating for um, various things using a bit of you know Twitter fame from back in the day. To, to turn it into positive action. Um, and I came up with a few fundraising ideas over the time. I, I pretty much sold everything I owned because I'd been booted out of America when my visa ran out anyway. So I was already used to not having much, but I pretty much sold everything. Um, and the only currency I accepted was trees. So it'd be a case of like 
you can buy this spare bike for, I think someone bought a spare bike for like 2000 trees and I cycled it to France for them. <laughs> um, but just sell whatever you've got that you don't need and, and go with minimalism, it's fun. Um, avoiding costs for trees. So every time I slept in a tent or um, every time somebody let me crash on their sofa or cooked me a meal or worked on my bike for free, um, I would put the money I would have spent on that into trees. Um, and I'd also do stupid dares like, I will cycle, uh, if I can cycle the entire height of Denmark in 24 hours, like how many trees are you gonna give me? Um, that was a really fun one. I slept for like two hours in a bush. Uh, but doing all those things, I managed to get to the top of the ecology leaderboard, planting a whole bunch of trees. Um, so come come take this spot, I'll, I'll challenge anyone. Uh, oh, it was cropped. But in the first COVID lockdown, my whole bike nomad thing wasn't really working out because when there's stay at home orders and you don't have a home, it's a bit tricky. So I ended up in an Airbnb thinking just for a week. And um, it was on a, it was a cottage. It was um, one of these little, little uh, buildings here. And uh, it was beautiful. I had no idea that it was in the middle of a 460 acre uh, farm, but it was amazing. I got taught to like hunt and fish. Um, I, I got to hang out with their four dogs and we, we foraged and I was like eating mushrooms and uh, discovered the invasive or diet where you just basically only, eat. Um, the only meat that you eat is from invasive animals. So you're, uh, it's even more environmentally beneficial than vegan. So you've got a baseline of vegan, but then you're also removing things that shouldn't be there like gray squirrels and, and invasive crawfish. And if you can get someone with a, with a uh, to, to take care of a muntjac deer for you even better. Um, and uh, yeah, it was an amazing four months of just like riding out lockdown in this really cool place. And while I was there, uh, they, the landowners expressed interest in trying to plant trees, but even though they have like a land agent who could have sorted that out for them, it's really hard and complicated and expensive. And um, they were just really confused about the whole thing. And I was like, oh, it can be that hard. And then the more I looked into it, the more I realized it just is ridiculous. Um, yeah, so my charity Protect Earth started with a few um, other folks. Um, it does two different types of projects. There's landowner projects where we work with people who already own their land. They're just trying to like plant some trees on it. We can get them their trees for free instead of them having to pay a substantial amount of money, which is how it normally works. Um, and we help with maintenance and a few other things. I've seen a lot of reforestation projects where people just dump a bunch of trees in the ground and shove off. Um, putting a huge amount of work onto the landowners' laps, which they're not always able to work on, let alone willing. Um, so we can not only get the trees for free, sometimes we can get them some money um, uh, for doing it, which is fair, you're using land. Um, and uh, yeah, we can help with maintenance by working with volunteers and local climate action groups, because we don't want like people driving around all over the place. Uh, it's an easy pitch to a lot of landowners. Um, basically i won't read the whole thing but like having trees in your land can um, add uh, shelter for livestock um it can reduce heating costs if you put a bunch of trees near um the oh, i can't think where the cows sleep i can't think of words right now if you put um trees near buildings it will reduce wind chill and therefore reduce costs of those buildings which is an environmental benefit too um as trees come down over time or you know some get disease whatever trees go through a life cycle when those trees are available for timber you can turn it into fencing and gates and posts and and, and fuel um, if you have uh, biomass eaters so um there's just a million different benefits to having a whole bunch of trees on your land um it can reduce soil erosion and water logging and yeah it makes the place nicer to to hang out at to work at so a bunch of good reasons and, and people are on board with it pretty often um and as well as the landowner projects uh we are working on buying our own land uh we've been looking at a lot of different sites we've had to turn down probably 10 different sites already and we've missed a few um by not quite being quick enough um funding has been an issue and i talk about why the banks are terrible but we we're trying to buy land we're looking at 29 acres right now colleges says it checks out we've got the money in the bank so it might happen um but yeah, we plant about 70% of it, leave the other 30% as, as different habitats, uh, depending on what the area is. Plant a bunch of wild fruit trees um, and shrubs so uh, animals and birds have food. Turn it into just a conservation site so we're not logging it or anything. Um, and add some footpaths for humans and maybe even put a site lacrosse course on there. Something like that, something fun um, for the kids to enjoy. 
And so in the second lockdown, um, yay for number two, back on the farm, ready to plant some trees. Uh, I had to do a lot of restoration work, maintenance work on the previous reforestation project. Um, there were a lot of tubes that, that uh, were starting to split and needed to be removed. Some of them, like this one, were just embedded into the tree because they left them on there for far too long. Um, and a lot of them had been blown over and no one had ever bothered to straighten them. So I made some cross braces with zip ties um, to, to straighten them back up again. And then by January, we were off to our first site in Wales, planting a whole bunch of trees. This was 500 um, trees, all native, uh, mostly broadleaf. Uh, another project in uh, Howard Court, it's called, which is a lovely wedding venue. You can go stay there as an Airbnb in these beautiful little shepherd's huts and take a look at our trees. Um, planted 1,600-ish uh, trees here. Um, it's near the North York Moors. Um, we had a bunch of volunteers coming, even though it was in the COVID lockdown, legally volunteering, you can just do whatever you want, apparently. Like I could, I could travel and stay in hotels. That's fine. I could leave my area where no one else could. I could go to Wales and back because I was looking at land. It was very strange. And I tried to use my powers for good. Um, but everyone was kind of uh, taking care of themselves. We all brought our own tools. We were all you know, using hand sanitizer if we swapped tools. And we even had a little baby come along and help. It was so cute. <laughs> um, it's not always quite so glamorous. We're literally shoveling a lot of horse shit um, on the farm to use this as mulch. It has to be well rotted. Um, so yay. Uh, but it all worked out. And, and all of our trees are doing really well. I've been around um, over spring and summer to check up on all five or six of our sites. and and. We, we've lost maybe 2% of the trees so far. So um, we are doing great. We can restock that 2% loss uh, next winter. And so, yeah, buying land is hard, um, obviously, but more than you think, <laughs> it really sucks. Um, finding land to buy, there's a few websites out there that are okay uklandandfarms.co.uk you can um you can sort it by acres or by price which is pretty handy uh adland.com is a really cool feature rich uh website that came out recently trying to make it easier it's not got a huge amount of content on there yet but it is growing all the time um on the market it's mostly focused at houses and they do have land on there but none of the features of the website are very good for land and right move similar problem um, a lot of the land you'll look at and it's like here's a small patch of dirt that you could buy for two million pounds because it's near a city or something so it's really hard to find like viable planting uh land we'll get into that um we've been looking a lot in south wales it's pretty cheap bath is ludicrous so for example i could get uh <laughs> well, there was 10 acres in bath for a hundred and fifty thousand pounds 10 acres and that was covered in it was, it was seven acres for one hundred fifty thousand pounds near Bath, or for 150,000, I could buy like 40 acres in Wales. It's kind of how it goes. Um, there's a lot of different things, a lot of different variables involved, but that generally speaking, the bigger you go, the cheaper it is per acre. Um, so less than 10 anywhere is going to cost you at least 10,000. Um, Cause a lot of the time that's getting into like horse paddocks and stuff and, and people pay a lot of money for those. Uh, but once it's really big, it, it can get quite cheap, especially if it's, low quality land and we'll get into that banks have been useless um i really wasn't expecting how useless they'd be so uh, i have spent a lot of time in the usa and i have great credit in the us and i thought i could just get a loan from them us banks don't want to loan for any projects outside of the us which sucks um uk high street banks will only mortgage land if you are planning on building houses on it at least one house and we don't want to build houses we want to save the planet so that's annoying um triados position themselves as looking to help charities um might have been covid related but they screwed me around for four months just trying to get on the phone uh, when i finally got through to the wrong department and wasted another month or two getting through to the right department um they basically said that we'd need a um we'd need a few years of business history and we'd need a, a business plan and all this other stuff. Um, and they just weren't particularly interested in helping because we were so new. Um, ecology with a Y, not ecology with an I, they're different. Ecology Building Society uh, will do it maximum of 25 acres. You can't like camp on it or do any commercial activities or do charity fundraisers or anything. You can just go and sit there with a book and go, hmm, a squirrel. And that's about the limitations. So that sucks. 
um, and basically no one would help. So uh, I decided to be the bank. Um, I've got an American self-managed 401k. I could dump half of that into uh, into the charity. Um, and then I dumped a bunch of my cash savings into the charity. I'm really hoping this works out. And a uh, similar idea in the, US, in the UK, you can use a self-managed SIP to be your own bank. Um, we've got had a few other lenders offering, you know, £10,000 each. Uh, and so now we're up to about 120000 of available uh, money through loans and donations that we can use to, to buy land. And the bit of land we want to buy is 120000 So we'll, we'll hopefully get that. But um, as soon as uh, a really cool thing about charities is uh, there's something called a social impact loan in, in the UK. And basically any UK taxpayer could loan us um, whatever they loan us. 30 percent of it is a tax break. So we, we could offer like a 0% loan to people. And if you loaned 10,000, you'd get 3,000 off your taxes, right? So uh, once that all comes through, that will hopefully open up a lot of funding and we can start doing like, um, you know, uh, pension. We can start talking to pension advisors about getting funding off of other people. So don't even need the banks. Uh, set up a Patreon. That was doing pretty well. Asim and a few other folks from around here were, were donating pretty early on. Now we've got a donor box because it's got lower fees and we have monthly subscribers on there awesome um we're on just giving as well so i like cycled down to croatia did a half iron man and then came back and then managed to raise a bit of money doing that uh, not the easiest way to get there but it is pretty and that's my my mascot came the whole way just riding up on the bars and keeping my carbon footprint down and cost down i was sleeping in a tent the whole time the um the forester caught me here in the morning i was on the german polish border the um the man with a shotgun woke me up and asked me what i was up to that was a little freaky uh but yeah by doing all of that we've managed to save enough that we can start buying some land but the next thing you got to think about is should this land be forested this is a common point of contention you see all the time people posting these articles um be, I, I don't know what contrarianism it is I, I think it's because people over focus on the importance of trees um like Trees are one useful part of the climate of solving the climate crisis, but because so many people focus purely on trees, like every single company is like, do this and we'll plant a tree, do this and we'll plant a tree. Everyone focuses so hard on trees that I think it's really popular to be like, actually, sometimes they're bad. Um, but it's really annoying and all ecologists know this. None of this is new information. Um, basically, if uh, certain companies like uh, Nestle, basically the financial incentives are, are a bit perverse it's like if you can get some cheap land and whack it full of trees you'll get some carbon savings great it doesn't really matter what trees you plant or if they're the right trees in the right place or if what was there was actually more beneficial for the environment than what you're putting there or if you planting trees is going to release more emissions than than um than they'd ever absorb if you've planted x number of trees in a certain area you get x number of credits right and so nestle had to rip up uh, all of their saplings after they wrecked a wildflower meadow. Uh, wildflower meadows can actually uh, have more uh, CO2 sequestration effect than woodlands. So that would have been bad. Um, there's a lot of companies out there not, not following the advice of ecologists. And if they are, they're trying to find the ones that will let them get away with stuff to, you know, within the letter of the law, but not the intent. So um, you don't want to plant wildflower meadows or like, uh, species rich grasslands or uh, peat bogs or all these other things and you don't want to plant high quality agricultural land um, in the UK we have this concept of grade one through four land and um, if you're taking grade one and grade two land which is like nice and flat fertile soils can you know do a lot of food production if you take that and just shove it full of trees those trees will grow quite well but then we have to find somewhere else to make that food and and that generally just means getting more food in from abroad um and and that often means deforestation right like all of the cattle production being done in, in the amazon if we take up all, too much agricultural land the argument is that that's going to push that to other countries which is true we do also need to be reducing our meat consumption so if there is um a, a slight impact to the amount of like uh, agricultural land available we should be able to lose some agricultural land um whilst also reducing our meat intake right by 50 percent, which is what the un recommends um so we are kind of going after the hilliest uh lowest quality farmland possible um and that's often kind of very hilly stuff that's that's the sort of land where 
they've just been running a few sheep up it. They don't really care. They're mostly collecting their basic payment subsidies. They've just got a few sheep on it because might as well. Um, and so we avoid peat bogs, grassland, wildflower meadows. We don't go for grade one or two agricultural land, stick into three or four. If it's if it literally says less favorable on there, that's pretty handy. Um, the government will actually pay uh, subsidies to landowners that have less favorable land going, we know this is shit, we're sorry, here's some free cash. So they're not very incentivized to do anything else with it. So if we can buy that land up and turn it into woodlands, then you know that, that's not really taking anything away from anyone. Um, when you're looking, if you see nitrate vulnerable, uh, that's actually fine. It just means don't use nitrates here because it will leach off into the system. So we're not going to use that. That's fine. These websites in the UK are useful for trying to find land that looks like you should buy it. Um, none of them will give you a full yes, but they can uh, let you know about a few no's. So if you look at the magic.defra.gov.uk, that's pretty good. Um, probably Google that one, Woodland Opportunities, Gulf Wales or um, Friends of the Earth did this website, takeclimateaction.uk slash woodland opportunity mapping even. And so don't base it just on this. This is one of the sites that we work on and the purple is an existing ancient woodland. Um, and uh, these greeny bits are kind of opportunities um, in theory, you could plant here. But again, a lot of this is uh, good agricultural land and there's actually some public access land here, which you're legally not allowed to plant. And then this is a triple SI, which you also can't plant. So it's a little funny. There's a few false positives on this website, but it will give you some idea. But generally you always want to get like a chartered forester or an ecologist or somebody to swing by and, and, and say whether it's actually good to buy it or not. Don't just go grabbing anything because we don't want to be Nestle, do we? Um, so how do you actually do a reforestation? How'd you plant all these trees? There's a few different um, ways to go uh, about it. There's a few different configurations of woodland. It's first important to think about what you're trying to achieve for your woodland, right? Um, a lot of people kind of confuse uh, tree planting with timber production, because if you're, if you're doing timber production, if you're doing commercial forestry, then yes, you are planting trees, but that doesn't mean that everyone who's planting trees is doing commercial forestry. Um, loads of articles really confuse that and it is frustrating. Um, so this chunk of land is just going to be a whole bunch of trees, and that's that. That's the end of that. Um, they're not cutting them down, not doing anything with them. Um, and so with that, like as trees uh, come down naturally, they might turn that into firewood, or maybe that they'll leave that wood alone and, and let it turn into a habitat if they don't need the wood. But so you, you kind of got this this one idea of a contiguous block of woodland. This is just going to be woodland. Um, we've done a few shelter belts. They're like hedgerows, but way bigger, and they use trees instead of just shrubs. Um, these create awesome uh, natural corridors for all sorts of wildlife, makes the bees happy, birds happy, all, all sorts of insects. Having more birds on the land means they eat more insects from the fields, um, the, the sort of kind of pests that you normally spray against. Uh, so that's, that means less insecticide required. Um, and it will reduce soil erosion. It increases soil fertility by sucking down nitrates and, and fixing them into the soil. Um, it creates a microclimate that can go a really long way. And it basically, um, it will basically kind of push cold air like wind. It will push wind up really quite high and it warms up the field. And the, that means the soil isn't being cooled down or eroded as much. And that means that the, the crops will actually grow better. They're not being battered. There's going to be less damage to them from the wind, um, but they're also going to be in a warmer climate. Um, and some studies done by University of Oxford uh, suggested they did this in, in Africa and it increased the yield of the farms by 20 percent, even when accounting for the loss of land to these strips. Um, they're not huge, but obviously this is taking a little bit of land out. And even with that little bit of land being uh, done, there's still a 20% increase um, in that. But annoyingly, these aren't funded by the government. Um, rules are always changing and grants always change. They change every year. But in the past, you had to be doing a contiguous block of woodland. They wouldn't fund, an, or, or a hedgerow. They'll fund hedgerows or woodland, but they won't fund a shelter belt, which is really annoying because they're useful and they still take up carbon, even if it's not a nice woodland you could walk around with your dog or whatever is still taking up carbon and providing habitat. So that's pretty frustrating. Um, ecology and Protect Earth fund 
uh, I funded three of these and we're going to do, I think, like 10 or 15 this winter. So um, see how many of those come through. Then there's silver pasture, um, agroforestry in general um, is the idea of kind of combining trees with your conventional farming. Um, we've kind of ripped out all of our trees all over the UK and I think the US is the same. The, the industrialized approach of agriculture is get everything out of there, get as much square inch as possible so that we can get our tractors around it and do all, all that industrial stuff. Um, and, and really science is showing that we need to revert that. That's not effective. It just involves throwing more fossil fuels and more fossil fuel based um, fertilizers at it. And then you kind of reach a limit of what that soil can do even with fertilizers and you're polluting the rivers and the streams and everything else. So um, like I mentioned, throwing a bunch of trees, you're slowing down the wind, you're providing shade from extreme heat, um, which is good for the cows. Uh, you're providing, um, uh, the, you're reducing the wind chill of the cows as well, which apparently makes them happier, which is the funniest thing. I think I might have forgot to mention that one. Yeah, makes cows happier. So shelter belts and any sort of trees, by slowing down the wind, you're making cows shiver less, which means you need to feed them less, which means, because <laughs> they're not burning as many calories shivering. Um, and so not only does that mean you save money on how much you need to feed your cows, um, but it also induces, uh, it also improves their mental health, I read somewhere. So uh, take that with a pinch of salt, but um, yeah. Silver pasture, really handy. And you can just dot trees around a field a bit randomly and let your livestock run through it. You've got to guard them all off and fence them up. It can be a bit tricky and expensive. Um, row planting is you put rows of trees, one, two or three uh, rows of trees of, of, of things that actually produce fruit. So you get a second harvest from it. You, um, you can get nuts, apples, pears, things like that, cherries. Uh, or cluster planting, you put little clumps here and there. And that's kind of like dot planting, so that's base planting. But the, the clumps of trees uh, will, will buffet the wind together a little better. So if you're somewhere very exposed, you can do that. And the governments don't, uh, government grants in the UK don't cover any of this either. Um, there, are, there are various companies and charities and organizations trying to kind of push farming towards this. And I'm sure uh, funding will change soon, but it's really not supported. So even if a farmer wants to do this, they have to pay for it all themselves. Uh, Planning the project, the next step, get a Google Maps out or the landapp.com. The land app is really good. Uh, we look at where they want to plant, select the areas, make sure there's no public access. This, this was public access, whoops. Um, and basically see how big the project is and if it's in an area of national outstanding beauty or any sensitive areas. And, and there's a bunch of different roles in different places. Um, England, Wales, Scotland are all different. Um, England, if it's less than two hectares, so like five acres, and it's not in an area of national outstanding beauty, you can probably plant that without needing any permission. Um, but if you try and do another five acres next year, then that's called like cumulative effect, and they'll, they'll do you for that. That's a, that's a 10 acre project. You just did it in two halves. Um, and Wales is a bit more lenient, so we can, we can do bigger projects in Wales without needing the support, uh, without needing the environmental impact assessment. And those things are terrible. EIA uh, took us six months to get rejected. We were trying to plant 3,000 trees. Um, so we applied in summer because planting happens in winter. Um, the Woodland Trust, we were working with the Woodland Trust at first. We're not doing that again. Um, they forgot to send the EIA at all. So I had to chase them. When they did um, uh, in August, a month later, uh, they sent it to Gloucestershire, not South Gloucestershire. Um, we waited several months because the local forestry commission officer um, it's off work. That's not Woodland Trust's fault. Um, he, he took like elective surgery in the middle of tree planting season, even though his job is forestry commission. Um, and so we couldn't get approved. There was a huge backlog. And by the time he, uh, the forestry commission officer came back, he had to ask the Cotswolds area of National Outstanding Beauty chap to go and have a wander around um, and, and take a look at it. By the time that guy got out, it was February. And he noticed that we we put some stuff on triple SI, a special scientific site, something interest and public access land. Um, and so he said, well, you can't plant those bits, but you could move them somewhere else. And by the time we tried to like figure out where else we could put them, he was like, oh, I'm not going to have time to go around before the end of this winter. Like all of this takes a really, really, really long time. And those early mistakes if if they hadn't happened we might have got in before the forestry commission chap went away why did he do an electric surgery in the middle of it anyway 
Um, we're trying to avoid doing this. And, and we, we tried to sneak it through in the end anyway by, by uh, planting half of the project by doing 1,500 trees um, uh, below the requirement for EIA. So um, that's, that's one thing you can do, just make the project smaller. But it, it's all really frustrating. The bureaucracy is, is mind numbing. But there are, there are some grants around. I've mentioned grants a bit. Um, Woodland Trust here. Uh, Woodland Trust covers 75% of the cost. They'll do it free if it's considered a community woods. Um, countryside Stewardship is the English government grant and they will give you 100% of the capital costs. So they'll give you X per tree, X per meter of fencing, X, you know, a, a certain amount for every tube, state guard, deer, fence, uh, badger gate, whatever you need. And they'll also give you 200 pounds a hectare for 10 years, um, which can actually be, uh, more than running sheep depending on where you are but at the end of that 10 years you you get nothing which is a bit scary to some people um and then there's the glass deer scheme in wales which is basically 69 uh, p per tree per year which is okay it's a bit of a slightly perverse incentive to just smush trees in together i'm sure they have some reasonable limitations i haven't looked into the glass deer scheme yet um so i talked about some of the kind of myths and things of, of there's a lot of topics that people talk about with reforestation that are kind of pretty snazzy headlines, but people don't know too much about them. Um, natural regeneration is like a really popular thing. I think uh, basically it's the idea of kind of fencing an area off and letting the land recover and then just become a forest by itself or become whatever it wants to by itself. Um, part of the problem there is that us humans have, have messed with things so much that it's not always possible for it to restore itself uh, uh, it quickly or effectively. Um, if you just fence off a random field in the middle of nowhere and there's no trees, you know, if you've got like 20 fields um, and, and right in the middle of them fields, you, you just fence it off, it's going to take an incredibly long time because there's no nearby source of, of seeds, right? Um, squirrels and, and jays and all sorts of different animals will move acorns around eventually and uh, different birds poop out different seeds but it really you would have to wait quite a long time for enough of that randomness to find its way to your field specifically and you'd have to hope that you know not everything gets eaten by hares and, and other stuff um so it can work and it has worked nicely in, in various places but it, it it's not like a, a silver bullet um alistair driver very well respected chap who works in reforestation and conservation in general um, who's saying they planted 200,000 trees, most protected with guards. Uh, I did insist a, insist a few thousand without any protection to see what happens and the hairs have blitzed them all. Um, yeah, trees get eaten real fast. We've lost a lot of trees. Uh, basically the problem is in winter where uh, saplings are generally planted, they're called bare root. They kind of, you just pull them out of the ground and plop them somewhere else. So they lose a lot of their roots. Um, they're not transported in soil like pots. They're just the cheapest way to do mass reforestation. Um, when you plant them in winter, there's no food around. There's, um, you know, there's no leaves on the trees. There's no, there's, there's no berries. There's no wild garlic for them to eat. There's nothing around really, uh, but saplings are food. So if you fill this empty bare field full of food, then things will appear to eat it. And that will be mice, shrews, moles, voles, rabbits, hares, deer, um, any livestock that got loose. We've had sheep sneak over, um, sneak through hedgerows and fences and, and, and nibble at some. Um, and so they'll eat them. And when trees are bigger and more mature, they're, they're not going to have a problem from those browsing animals. But when they're small, they'll just destroy them. Uh, and some areas have bigger problems with pests than others. Um, some areas of the world have natural predators, uh, more. Um, I mean, the, U the UK doesn't have any, we got rid of all of our bears and wolves and lynx and wildcats. So if we were to bring some of those back, <laughs> they would manage the populations of some of these pest animals that, that, that eat the trees. Uh, but that's a whole other topic. Uh, wildcats are coming back to Scotland though, which is pretty cool. It's a good start. That goes well, maybe the lynx. But yeah, there's been a few articles recently about success stories of, of, of natural regeneration of uh, these jays were planting half of the oaks in this woodland, right? It's pretty cool. Um, they just bury them. And, and why not both is usually the answer. Like if you get a, a big chunk of land, I know a lot of people doing this, even needs trees doing this. 
um, will be doing the same thing where you plant a fair bit of it to get some sort of woodland established pretty quick. And then you leave areas as clearings. And if they decide to, to fill themselves in, great. If they stay as clearings, great. You know, do both. This is a really controversial topic. It seems like the general public getting really upset about, uh, I mean, obviously I'm the general public. I'm not a qualified ecologist. I've just been working on this stuff for a while, planting trees for a while. But to the average person that hasn't looked into it that much, there's a lot of fury about plastic. Um, and you see a field like this, and I see this and I go, wow, this is an impressive reforestation project. That's huge, right? And other people were like, well, these are shitty little manky saplings with, you know, disgusting plastic tubes. And oh, this is terrible. Um, this is actually along the HS2 line. I was checking out the quality of their work and they've done a pretty good job. Um, I think 20% of their guards are um, biodegradable or cardboard, but most of it is plastic. And, and that's pretty common. Like everyone just uses plastic. Um, reason for that, like I said, hairs, moles, voles, all sorts of different things are trying to eat these trees. And if you take them off, they'll all die. Um, but if you use plastic, then people complain about plastic. And um, I think a lot of the complaints, because we've all, a lot of us have probably seen this, where people have just left their plastic lying around really lazily. And like this one's just embedded in the dirt and it will just live there forever. And, and this is disgusting. This is pathetic. Someone just hasn't collected up their tubes afterwards. All you have to do is run a knife up it, slice it out and, and collect them up. And you can recycle these. They can be used to make more um, tubes in the future, right? Um, you can recycle them through AgriCycle or uh, TubeX, who makes this brand of tubes, recycle them themselves. You can just say, oh, take your stuff back. The one alternative is deer fencing, which is really expensive because you have to build it really high because deer can jump really high. <laughs> um, it also doesn't stop mice, shrews, voles, rabbits, and stuff like that. So you still need other smaller guards anyway. You don't need the full 1.2 meter tubes, but you need something. Um, we're giving this a go on an 11 acre project in, in winter, just fencing it off and then using small cardboard guards for the rest of it. Um, we hope that works. We'll, we'll probably mix up some plastic and some cardboard as a bit of an experiment to see like, hey, all the trees in the cardboard ones have been eaten, but all the trees, if that happens, we just won't use cardboard again or we won't use the same brand. Um, but it's all about doing experimentations um, to, to see how things go. Uh, and then, yeah, this can be removed once the trees are mature, so it's not going to like forever impact the environment. We have been experimenting with biodegradable um, spirals, and these were destroyed by rabbits in the first three months. Uh, rabbits got through loads of these. We've had to replace, we will have to replace a lot of those, which is really upsetting. You buy a product to protect the tree from rabbits, and it just doesn't. <laughs> it's just shit. So we won't be using that uh, grant won't be using that brand again either. Another experiment, um, I mentioned Avon needs trees. They literally needed some trees. They ran out of trees and we gave them 400 and they, they uh, and we supplied the hemp mulch mats, which keeps the grass back to keep the um, competition down from the grass. And uh, we've got cardboard uh, guards and bamboo sticks. So bamboo is awesome at su sucking up CO2. Um, it will biodegrade entirely. It's not being kind of treated with loads of disgusting chemicals like steaks. Um, the cardboard will break down naturally and the hemp obviously will as well. So this is the most ideal approach if they work. We've had really negative feedback about this specific brand of, of cardboard um, guard. Uh, the salesman was literally trying to convince me not to use them and say, wait till next year, they'll be better. Um, but we wanted to give them a try anyway. And, and again, if, if, if some don't make it, like replacing a sapling is like 50p, but um, we really would like uh, to be able to use not plastic. Um, but currently I think probably 90% of our stuff is is done with uh, plastic and it's some more cardboard, yeah. Hey Phil, I'm just gonna hey. give you a heads up. We're 15 minutes out. So if you can wrap up okay. the next couple of minutes of yeah. the questions, cool. Yes, yes, pretty close. Uh, um, so yeah, there's a bunch of really cool new products coming on the market. Even HS2 subcontractors are experimenting with different options. Uh, we've got, um, none of them are on the market yet, but they've been doing experiments this year. And so these ones in the picture are made out of wool, which I think is awesome. Um, and there's other cardboard layers and things like that. Um, why so close together? You see this and you think they're all a bit close together. You plant more than what you want. Mice will eat some, drought takes some, deer takes some, slugs eat some. Um, and then what you're left with is hopefully a woodland. 
uh, if you plant the exact right number and and then you know a bunch of them die you don't have a woodland you have a field with some trees in it so overstocking is a good thing um and then you thin them afterwards so at years 5 10 and 20 you cut down a bunch of those trees maybe it's 20 30 percent it depends how many survived um you are aiming for a certain uh density of woodland and so you can you can restock anything that's that's fallen too low um and you can thin anything that's too high so it's just part of the management process and then the last thing real quick carbon offsetting is a really controversial topic and uh if people have questions about it i'd love to talk about it a lot of the time you see people saying oh I'll buy a t-shirt and we'll plant a tree or whatever and that's usually not really carbon offsetting um Offsetting comes in the form of credits, and we've already seen those companies, uh, this lot, Nature Conservancy, were basically saying, oh, these woodlands are going to get cut down unless Pepsi protect them, give us some money, and then Pepsi gave them money, and they're like, thank you, you protected the woodland, there was never any threat to that woodland. Um, and again, Nestle kind of like doing stupid stuff. It, there are people out there, there's a wooden carbon code in the UK is a great source of funding for people who want to do reforestation projects. Um, you have to work with the Forestry Commission and the Soil Association, and they verify everything that you're doing. And then companies like Waitrose buy a bunch of them. And so I would rather try and create genuine woodland carbon code credits and sell them to companies than company, you know, and have all of the decisions powered by ecologists than have idiot companies trying to do it on a budget and just ruining everything because they cheaped out. So um, the more people that can put legit carbon code um credits into the marketplace the better as far as i'm concerned and obviously those companies need to reduce their carbon footprint as well but that's that's for someone else to shower them about that's that's not something i can help with and real fast tree planting tech we built an iphone app and an Airtable thing and we have a photograph of every one of our trees um and we are putting that through an api and presenting it soon on the website um, and I can like walk soon, I'll be able to walk around the field, see where all of my trees are and go, oh, that one didn't make it, that needs restocking, or oh, that one's doing fine. Um, so I'm excited to, to build more tech and, and demonstrate more statistics and, and other things so people can see what we're up to. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much everything I know about reforestation in a real fast 45 thing, minute thing. So let me know if you have any questions about that. <laughs> That, wow, I'm gonna have to rewatch that because that was a lot of <laughs> awesome information. Um, really, yeah. so uh, oh, all right, I'm you. going to stop recording so we can do some Q and A.